think everybody was back. We're welcome to the show first evening. So um, we're doing this series of uh, sessions on the Eucharist uh, as part of the sanctuary's participation in uh, the three-year process of the United States Bishop emphasizing the, the gift of the Eucharist. So uh, last week when we gathered, we looked at some of the Old Testament roots to the Eucharist and spent quite a lot of time with the Passover, which is really the main connection. That's how God prepared his people for the gift of himself in the Eucharist, I believe, by instituting a perpetual memorial that would always be remembered annually, year by year, uh, with uh, both blood and also unleavened bread. So the central symbols reminded Israel, God's people, of God's fidelity to them uh, the night that the destroying angel passed over uh, Egypt and God began the work of liberating God's people from slavery. So we spent a lot of time on that last week. Uh, we looked a bit at the gift of manna in the desert, the food that God provided for the journey along the way. And we also looked at that mysterious figure in the book of Genesis, Melchizedek, the priest who provided bread and wine to Abraham. And uh, we also looked at, briefly, at the uh, emphasis on banquets and feasting in the Old Testament as a sign of God's faithfulness, so especially in Isaiah 25, God speaking, I will provide a feast for you, rich, juicy foods and choice wines on a mountain top, and the veil of death will be destroyed, and tears will be wiped away. So those prophetic utterances often centered on a promise of a messianic banquet with God. So, so that was sort of a quick overview of last week. So let us begin tonight with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh God, all gracious and loving, we thank you for gathering us tonight as we ponder more deeply the mystery of your Son's presence in the Eucharist and deepen the love and appreciation for so great a sacrament. As we see the traces of it in his life on earth, help us to remember the traces of your presence in our own lives. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so tonight uh, we jump right into uh, the life of Jesus. So, uh, one evening for the thousands of years or the hundreds of years that preceded Jesus, and tonight we're going to focus on the person of Jesus, the one who instituted the great mystery of the Eucharist and gave himself to us uh, in the gift of his body and blood at the Last Supper. But I think it's important to recognize that that final meal that Jesus shared with the apostles in the upper room was a culmination of so many things in the life of Jesus. So we want to start tonight by thinking a bit about what preceded that last evening together that the apostles shared with Jesus in the upper room. And uh, of note, by the way, I mentioned that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, but Bethlehem is also a word uh, that means the house of bread, and uh, so significant that the bread of life is born in a place that is called the house of bread. It's also significant that in the story in Luke's Gospel that Jesus is laid in a feeding trough uh, when he is born. So the place of nourishment is the place he shows up. So that there is deep symbolism even in the Christmas narratives uh, that point us already toward the mystery of the Eucharist, uh, the gift of Jesus and his body and blood. Just as, by the way, um, the, the pursuit to, ch to kill the children uh, by King Herod is already pointing us in the direction uh, of the Paschal mystery, the cross of Jesus. So even in the infancy narratives, there are foreshadowings of, of the death of Jesus at the end. So uh, the Gospel writers remember uh, right Gospels and a tradition that's been handed on to them for several, for a couple of generations. And so they know the end of the story as they write the beginning of it. They, they write Gospels with resurrection glasses. They, they know of the dying and rising of Jesus. 
So as I look back at the unfolding, um, some of the elements that you see so clearly are shaped by their own experience of gathering for what we call the Eucharist. So that would have been one of the key places that the stories about Jesus' life would have been shared. So we already hear in the Acts of the Apostles, and we'll, we'll circle back to this, but we hear about how the Apostles gathered together uh, for the breaking of the bread, and that was an early name for the Eucharist, and that the Apostles' teachings were studied. What were the teachings of the Apostles? The teachings of the Apostles would be focused on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, what will later be the New Testament. So those 27 books that later become the New Testament are the written record of that oral tradition. So you can well imagine that after the death and resurrection of Jesus, as the apostles gather to, to break the bread and to share the memories of Jesus and told the stories that their insights into what Jesus did during his lifetime uh, were shaped by that Eucharistic telling. And you'll see that in certain of the stories quite clearly in the Gospels. So, uh, all the way back to the birth of Jesus. The second note that I want to highlight uh, the meals of Jesus are, are highlights throughout the four Gospels. And uh, so much so that Jesus' table fellowship becomes one of the elements of his ministry that is such a hallmark that the people who are particularly religious begin to complain. So if you may remember this past Sunday, the Gospel uh, for uh, the weekend was the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And verse 1 begins with the words, the tax collectors and sinners. So who are tax collectors? Uh, they would be people in the days of Jesus who would be publicly despised. You know, those kind of people we don't get along with. Why? Uh, it would be, to draw a terrible analogy today, but it's sort of like when Russia invades your country in Ukraine and you're oppressed by them. You know, those occupying leaders don't get your favor, let's put it that way. So the tax collectors collaborated with the Roman Empire and often took money for themselves along the way. So they were publicly known among faithful Jews uh, as sinners. You know, they were not the people you would want to associate with. How many of you all have seen any of the uh, television series The Chosen? Okay, if you've seen that, they do a really good job of portraying Table Fellowship throughout that series, the Jesus Table Fellowship, but also you get a good insight into the way that Matthew, the tax collector, was treated by people around him as a collaborator with the Romans. So I think that's historically quite well done, actually. So, um, so the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, by the way, in the time of Jesus would be your devout lay people. So they really tried to follow the law of Moses in all the particular details of their lives. So very faithful, dedicated, committed, ordinary lay people in the time of Jesus. They were not priests. Uh, and the scribes were the theologians, so the religious experts of the day. So the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So that is the critique. And that prompts Jesus, by the way, to tell those three profound stories that probably all of us could tell from memory, right? We could tell them to our children about the, the man who had a hundred sheep and one of them got lost. And he went and looked for that lost sheep. And more joy in heaven over that one lost <coughs> sheep returning than over the 99 righteous people who had no need to repent. And then the woman who sweeps up her coin. Now remember, we, I mean, we would think today a coin, I mean, forget about that quarter that fell on the floor. But remember that coins were precious uh, commodities to people, and one tenth of her wealth had just suddenly disappeared. So this is, uh, you know, this is, this matters to her. Uh, probably the nearest that we can come to it today is when you can't find your wallet or your credit card or your, your cell phone or your keys or something, and you're panicking. Where did my cell phone go? Where did my Where's my, what happened to that credit card? You know, if you've ever had a panic, did it get stolen? You know, is money charging things on me? The fear of that and that, the fighting, you know, the joy of that. 
And then, of course, the most profound, which if you're at the masses, I celebrated. I didn't include the, the final of the three stories. It was an option. But the son that is lost. And Jesus is masterful because in that narrative, you have the son who is the public sinner. He goes out and does things he shouldn't do. And, and the father welcomes him home with great joy. But you also have the angry older son. And that angry older son does not want to go in and celebrate with that younger son, that son of yours, not this your brother. You know, you notice the father goes out to both of them. And the story is deliberately told by Jesus, those three stories, to comment on the attitude of religious people who are wondering why Jesus is associating with them. Table fellowship with sinners. Why does he welcome them? So make no mistake about it, the meals of Jesus are highly significant events. Uh, meals are important in almost every human culture, aren't they? And special meals are important in our own culture. We all have very important, significant meal events that we can look back to in our memories that are charged with meaning. Uh, you know, just to name a couple myself, as a little child, I remember going to my grandmother's house, my Italian grandmother, and she would bring out the fine china and uh, cook homemade ravioli and meatballs. And, and uh, I saw foods that I didn't ordinarily see and at the dining room table with special tablecloth. You know, there were elements of memories of meals that to this day shape my memory of life. And undoubtedly, those meals that Jesus shared with the apostles, and you know, they're, they're alluded to again and again throughout the Gospels. But he goes, you know, Jesus is um, not what you would call a discriminant diner. So he, he will go to the, to the scribes and Pharisees' homes, he will go to wealthy people's homes, he'll go to but he, if you go to Luke chapter 14, by the way, if you've got your Bible with you tonight, it's a little section of Luke's Gospel where uh, some people call it the banquet section of the Gospel. So um, uh, Jesus heals this man at the beginning of chapter 14 of Luke's Gospel who uh, had dropsy, and then he speaks about uh, banqueting and tables. And if you look at verse 8, he will look, verse 7 says, He told a parable to those who had been invited, noticing how they were choosing the places of honor at the table. So, rushing to get the best seats. And that's where Jesus says, You know, when you go to a banquet, go to the lowest place so you can be invited up higher. Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, Don't invite your friends and relatives who are going to pay you back. You know, but invite in the Verse 13, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and blind. Blessed indeed will you because of their inability to repay you. So the meals of Jesus, the way he welcomes the broken, wounded people of his own day, the sinners, the lame, the afflicted, the blind, everybody that felt unconnected, separated, alone, isolated, wounded, they experienced the gracious of God in the person of Jesus. That's why the religious people are so scandalous. You're supposed to be a holy man and you're doing things like you shouldn't be doing them. That's the judgment against Jesus, which will eventually, by the way, get him put to death. So, um, And then he talks about the great feast. Um, you know, everybody gets invited to this banquet and all the invited guests just don't show up. So just go on the streets and start dragging everybody in. And, um, and then that's when, in chapter 15, you have to notice about why is he welcoming people like that. So one of those powerful moments in the life of Jesus. But so we have these very prominent meals, that, and Jesus is referring to banquets and eating and, and how we ought to live banquet life together. Um, this tells the church something about the Eucharist and the way we should be together as church, doesn't it? We shouldn't be trying to find well people, you know, that are holy and doing fine and whole and wonderful and inviting them in. We should be reaching out to the people who need the banquet of the Eucharist. So uh, I do think that Pope Francis has rightly noted that the Eucharist is medicine for sinners. It's not a reward for our, our just behavior. So that's a different 
Because remember, at the Last Supper, every one of the twelve were, in a certain way, going to be very unworthy very shortly thereafter. So they will all abandon Jesus. One of them will betray him, and one of them, his leader, will deny three times that he knows him. So, and yet he doesn't hesitate to give that, the gift of himself at that moment. This is my body, it's for you. Even Jews guess it. So, you know, so there's something about the way that Jesus responds to humanity in his own time and age that is pointing us to what the church is supposed to be about. So that imagery of Pope Francis, that we are a field hospital of churches for the wounded of the world is quite correct, actually. So a, a, a brilliant analysis, I believe, of what Jesus is actually about in the Gospels. So, um, so these are profound moments. Uh, you also see, I uh, like this little narrative too, if you go back to Mark chapter 2, and here I do think, you know, you got uh, Chosen does a nice job with Matthew. So in Mark's Gospel, you have this, um, in chapter 2, verse 13, uh, a tax collector by the name of Levi was called to follow Jesus. That story in, this, in Matthew's Gospel doesn't have the name Levi, it has the name Matthew. So uh, perhaps two different names for the same person, or there's a reason that Matthew uses the name Matthew in his narrative. So the name Matthew is added to the gospel, by the way. It's not in the text, but in the first century, or the second century. So um, <coughs> tradition. So, but what happens is, after he calls Levi or Matthew to follow in verse 15, well, he was at table in his house. So note that Jesus calls Levi or Matthew to follow him and immediately goes to his house to have a meal with him. Uh, sort of like when you get to Jericho on, on his way up to Jerusalem and little Zacchaeus with some other tax collectors climbed a tree and he's so joyful to see Jesus. He gets up on this tree and makes himself look ridiculous. And Jesus says, and Luke, uh, Luke is clear, Jesus had intended to pass through Jericho but when he saw Zacchaeus in the tree, he decided to stay. He had to stay. I have to stay at your house today. So the behavior of Zacchaeus in welcoming Jesus uh, draws Jesus to stay with him. So while they were, so back in Mark again, while he was at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners sat with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. It's interesting if you watch The Chosen, you know, even Peter is a little annoyed that Jesus called a tax collector at first. Like Matthew and he are not quite best buddies right at the beginning, you know. Some scribes who were Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors and said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus heard this and said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is kind of the spring. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It says, opening salvo. You know, something different and new is happening. The kingdom of God is breaking in, and the, the kingdom is becoming present in the person of Jesus. God is acting through him. That's why Jesus will say, I forgive you. And that also creates scandal. You know, who are you to forgive sins? God alone can do that. So immediately, we start getting an awareness Jesus is more than, than people realize at the beginning. This, we will say in our creeds, is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. This is God acting in the person of Jesus. So the second person of the Trinity. Alright, so meals in the life of Jesus are very important. Uh, thirdly, uh, and we're all very familiar with the feedings of the multitude. Right? The multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Uh, when you go to the Sea of Galilee today, there is a little church uh, called Topgoth where it commemorates that place uh, by the Sea of Galilee that marks the feeding of the multitudes. And they have in the little mosaics in the floor there, mosaics of bread and fish, the Eucharistic elements. So it's a reminder, there's a church there, beautiful uh, church in that location. I will also add, you know, it's a stone's throw, you can walk right over to the Mensa Christi, 
which is right at the edge of the Sea of Galilee, where after the resurrection, Jesus fed Peter and the apostles after he appeared to them in the boat. He's cooking fish and bread for them on a fire uh, as he reveals himself after his dying and rising. So the, these places were so close together around the Sea of Galilee. The memories of the meals, of the eating together, of the feeding of the hungry and so forth, there's, there's a constant concentration. And when you look up to the top of the hill, the top of that hill is the top of the Mount of Beatitudes, where the Sermon on the Mount took place. So, and then right around the corner of the sea is the village of Capernaum, where Jesus spent a lot of his time with, that's where Peter the fisherman left. And Peter's house is there right on the edge of the sea. So all these things happened in a very short stretch uh, along this particular, I guess the north um, west coast, coastal area of the Sea of Galilee, kind of a small little arc of space. So, um, so let's go to Mark chapter six. Um, now, it's interesting, by the way. Uh, sometimes people don't realize this. I didn't until I studied the New Testament carefully. There are actually two separate feedings of thousands. There's the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. So there are actually two separate narratives in the Gospel of Mark that both describe the feeding of great multitudes. And uh, Matthew has both of them in his Gospel. Uh, Luke only has one in his Gospel. Uh, scholars ask that question. Why does Luke only report it once? You know, he's, he had Mark's Gospel. He knows Mark had two stories of the feeding of multitudes. Well, Luke is a good writer. And he's saying, well, this is kind of a double, and we don't need to repeat the story again. So let's be, let's can be concise in it. So Luke doesn't repeat the second feeding of the multitudes. But it's interesting because John's gospel, which if you if you take a close examination of John in comparison to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, almost all the stories found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke you cannot find in the Gospel of John. And almost all the things you find in the Gospel of John you cannot find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's not a lot of overlap, surprisingly. But the one story that is in John's Gospel, and it's one of the only miracles that happens in all four Gospels, is the feeding of the multitudes. So uh, associated with the Bible discourse in chapter 6. So all four strands of Gospel tradition have a clear etched memory of these feedings of Jesus. So, very, so you know you're coming up on something very significant see something like that happening. So let's start with Mark chapter 6 um, and let's start with verse 34. Would someone want to read that for us? Be bold in your proclamation. Yes. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Let me keep going. Yeah, By now, it was, strict, it was already late, and his disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already very late. Dismiss them so they can go to the surrounding farms and villages and buy themselves something to eat. He said to them in reply, Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Are we to buy 200 days' wages worth of food and give it to them to eat? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five loaves and two fishes. So he gave orders to have them sit down in groups on the green grass. The people took their places in rows by hundreds and by fifties. Then taking the five loaves, and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up twelve wicker baskets full of fixed fragments and what was left of the fish. Those who ate of the loaves were five thousand men. Wow. So five loaves, five thousand men, and twelve wicker baskets. So this superabundant, miraculous feeding. By the way, this is pointing back to Elisha, 
there's a story of the prophet Elisha. He fed a, an army of people with a small amount of food, like 20 loaves. He fed 100 people or something. So the numbers were far less. So you know, this whole idea, Elijah could do great things through the power of God, but there's something greater than Elijah here. So he is able to somehow feed the hungers of this immense crowd. And did you notice any Eucharistic elements in this narrative that made you think about the Eucharist already? God gave thanks. All right. He gave thanks. And he broke it. He broke it. He blessed it. He blessed it. And he gave it to them to eat. It's the very same verbs used in the Eucharistic narrative. He took, blessed, broke, and gave. So, when Jesus at the Last Supper took bread, broke it, and gave it to them and said, take this and eat, their memory of what he had done that day, feeding the multitudes, came back, and vice versa. After they experienced the Last Supper, as they're remembering back and telling the story in the Gospels, they are remembering the very words of Jesus that they heard over and over again, that every Eucharist they celebrated. So they, the words naturally fall into place in this narrative. Um, it's, it's interesting because it's an impossible miracle. There it seems to be insufficiency, but God provides enough for everybody, and there's always a super abundant leftover. There's something about our own human situation where we believe we're always in scarcity, there's never enough, and God is always saying, The universe I've given to you is super abundant. I will give you everything that, that you need in your life. You will have your daily bread. Isn't it interesting that when he finally taught them a prayer, an essential component of the prayer is, give us this day our daily bread. So that's significance of that connection. That's odd, isn't it? So, <laughs> background backwards. Um Any other elements that struck you about this narrative? Yes, and especially when we get to the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. you will see that because John will take in his Gospel all the fundamental core elements of the Jewish faith and its celebrations and will show how Jesus not only, in a sense, fulfills them, but goes beyond them. Mm -hmm. That's all the way through the Gospel of John. It's kind of a, a catechesis on how Jesus himself, you know, it's not the Jacob well, it's not the water Jacob gave him, I am the living water. It's not the bread you received in the desert, but man, I am the living bread. You know, it was not Moses who gave you these things, but my Father in heaven. I am that bread. So again and again, I am the true light of the world. You know, so this, I, those I am statements in John, so you're pointing in the, in the right direction. The other little element I wanted to point out was the apostles. What is their best plan? We don't have now, but send them away someplace else to get food. They need to go get some nourishment. And notice that Jesus involves them in the process. No. You give them some food to eat, so we don't have enough. What do you have? Well, five loaves and two fish. So the fish also has a Eucharistic meaning in the early church, and Jesus and the ancient iconography is often presented in the symbol of the fish. So the other thing that strikes me when I read these is when they say um, those who ate were 5,000 men, and surely there must have been women and children there as well oh, who got to eat. Yeah, yeah. One of the other Gospels makes it clear, and that doesn't even count the women and the children. Yes. <laughs> Mark, Mark probably just means 5,000 men. Like he, He's probably using men in an inclusive sense, uh -huh. men, men and children, but that's not what the other Gospels say, so it's a good help further. Uh, let's look at Matthew's version of that. It's in Matthew 14. Let's get it quick. Matthew and Mark are pretty, usually pretty close in their narratives. Most modern biblical scholars think that that Matthew um, had an account of Mark in front of him when he wrote his gospel. So that uh, explains close to the parallels there. Uh, but Matthew 14 and 
and verse 13 and following. If you read the narrative there, um, chapter 14, Matthew's Gospel, starting at verse 13. And if you, we could read that a lot, you know, this is very close, but there are When Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted, deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, Bring them to me. And he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets full. Those who who are those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting women and children. Right, so yeah, Matthew makes it clear. That didn't even count the women and children, think about how many thousands there were. You know. Ten thousand at least. <laughs> Um, so, curious, Jesus involves the apostles in giving the food. And with the Eucharist, the Lord doesn't come to become present to us without people who are set apart to provide the Eucharist for us. Right? So, there's a Jesus wants to feed us through each other. Right? There's a core mystery there. Twelve wicker baskets. Twelve apostles, twelve tribes of Israel. What are the gospel writers telling us? This is food for all of God's people, the whole bunch of them, all twelve tribes. Jesus is reconstituting God's people, and there's an abundance for all of them, all twelve tribes. We're not going to run out today. There's, there's enough for everybody. That's super abundance of God, His goodness, in our regard. Would you say the same is true when there were five loaves and two fish and five and two make seven? Probably, yes, there's a, probably symbolism <laughs> involved in that, too. You know, five is always the Pentateuch, Genesis 6. So two, you know, seven is a, a perfect number in Scripture. So, you know, these things often do have hidden meanings, too. Now, we'll just glance up Luke very quickly. Uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, and we'll start in verse 10. Luke does all have unique elements here. Someone read that okay, picture and see what you do with Luke. Okay. All the returners, that's what I do. Luke. Luke um, chapter 9. Got it. Okay. On the return, the apostles told him what they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowd learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them, spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and cured those who had need of healing. And the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the villages and country round about to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a lonely place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in companies, about fifty each. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were satisfied, and they took up what was left over, twelve baskets of broken pieces. All right, notice that Luke does rearrange the wording a bit of the narrative. Uh, like he mentions the 5,000 people early on, he wants to make you make it clear. That was a kind of surprise line. And Matthew and Mark at the end, like, wow, that was 5,000 people. But Luke is kind of telling us in the midst of the narrative, 
one of the great emphases of the Gospel of Luke is Jesus as healer. And you notice the answer to about, uh, and heal those who needed to be healed. So the healing power of Jesus is a highlight also of Luke. So we shouldn't um, depart without looking at Mark's second narrative of multiplication of loaves. So let's look at Mark chapter 8. And uh, we'll start with the first one. So I want to read that for us. So remember, we've already had a Mark's Gospel feeding of 5,000. This is a narrative a few chapters later. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come a long way. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these men with bread here in the desert? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? They said, Seven. And he commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he commanded that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away, and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanus. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, one biblical scholar noted, he said, so, you know, why Jesus is going to speak to these 4,000 people? You know, why didn't one of them say, well, remember what you did when we had the 5,000? So, you know, it's kind of like, if you take it as if just a few chapters later, Jesus is doing it again, it could be that the story was handed down in various traditions to separate versions, God incorporated into the gospel. But some also believe that one of them takes place on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, and the other across the sea, which shows that Jesus is feeding both traditionally the Jewish area and the Gentile areas. So the feedings have a, a, a symbolism of having two of them, and you have slightly different numbers, seven fish, seven baskets. Uh, you know, so you have, or seven loaves, you have slightly, you have some variation from things. In this one, though, you notice that Jesus takes the initiative he said, he should point out the problem. We've got a problem here. They've been with me three days. Whenever you hear the name three days, this is very significant. It almost always would make a disciple think about the third day he rose from the dead. So people have been scattered after the death of Jesus. On the third day, they're dying for nourishment. Now it's time for us to feed them. So it's pointing us in another sort of way to the Paschal mystery. Right now, we, so this uh, narrative in Mark's Gospel, the second feeding, will also show up in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew will also repeat it. Now, let's take a peek at John real quick. We have not looked yet at his Gospel with his feeding, because John also has the feeding. And John does have a distinct tradition here. Um, you will notice some unique elements. Alright, so John chapter 6, verse 1. So we want to read that for us. Fourth gospel. After this, Jesus went across the sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. 
there's so many. Jesus said, have the people reply. Now, there was a great deal of grass in that place. So the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled the twelve wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come to carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. Okay. <clears throat> Notice a, a distinct uh, narrative of John's gospel. <clears throat> John has this uh, way of presenting Jesus and his encounters with people where he likes to do things one on one. So we think about Jesus and the woman of Samaria, Jesus and the man born blind. So this time when the problem emerges, Jesus has a one on one conversation with Philip about it. Then Philip says, Well, then Andrew shows up. Well, I got this boy. And notice the boy is that we haven't heard the story about the boy before. The, they're barley loves, we haven't heard barley yet. So. But notice the same verbs are used. And in John's Gospel, this is even more significant because of the four Gospels, John is the only one of the four that will not tell us the story of the Last Supper about bread and wine. So it does not appear in the Gospel of John. So the fact that John, in this early part of his Gospel, has these Eucharistic elements associated with this feeding is very significant. And this is going to open up in John's Gospel for one of, John has these very, Jesus having these very long dialogues or monologues with people where he is self-explaining himself in a way that he doesn't speak in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're almost theological reflections on the person of Jesus put on the lips of Jesus in the Gospel of John. So very theologically rich, uh, expositions, and in this case, in John's Gospel, chapter six, it will be it will be a reflection on Jesus, who is the Eucharistic bread of life. So it will be John's way of reflecting on the mystery of the Eucharist, since he's not going to tell us the story of the Last Supper in the same way. John does, by the way, have the final supper of Jesus, but instead of talking about the breaking of the bread and the giving of the cup. He will talk about something the other apostles don't talk about in their Gospels, which is the washing of the feet. And then you will have a very long farewell address. As the Father and I are one, so you must be one. As the Father loves me, so I love you. And that will all culminate with Jesus, but with his high priestly prayer for his people. So John has a very unique exposition of the Last Supper. And it's interesting because when we celebrate the institution of the Eucharist, Holy Thursday as Catholics, the gospel we proclaim is John's gospel about the washing of the feet. So we have connected the washing of the feet, that act of loving service, directly with the Eucharistic mystery. And the way we liturgically structure our liturgical view as Catholics. So uh, this whole chapter 6 in John's gospel, well, we have the walking on the water, which by the way, that narrative is also one that appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it also follows the first multiplication of the loaves. So it's that walking on the water is connected closely with the feet. You know, I'm with you when you're in the boat together. The boat is a symbol of the church. The presence of the risen Lord is walking with us in the storms of life. So it's profound symbolism. And at one point, they're in the boat again, and and uh, Jesus warns them, watch out for the, the yeast of the Pharisees. And they say, oh my goodness, why is he talking about yeast? We forgot to bring lunch, didn't we? We didn't bring enough food. And Jesus says, don't you remember about the loaves? You know, 5,000 and 4,000. You don't, you still don't get it, do you? That's his kind of response to the apostles. They're, they're worried about not having enough food still. You know, we're, we're going to be short, aren't we? And uh, he says, you don't, 
getting it, doing I'll, I'll provide everything you need, which is really himself, right? He is all, all we need. So, with that frame of reference, we're going to dive into John's Bread of Life discourse. It's a beautiful reflection on the Eucharistic mystery. So, chapter 6, start in verse 22. Gave me, 
but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. Sure, I'm going to continue. Did I go on? Sure. The Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, it is not Jesus, the son of Joseph. Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father has sent me to draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you. Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. Now I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. All right. So in John's gospel, the people around Jesus, including the apostles at times, don't seem to understand very quickly what Jesus is trying to teach them. And we run into that sense here, don't we? And what are you talking about? And so finally, Jesus has to get it very clear. I am the bread of life. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So this bread, it's me, is my flesh given for the life of the world. When Jesus uses those words, and the early Christian community is hearing this, what do they immediately see in their mind? Not cannibalism, the Christian community. Well, the Eucharist for sure, but they're pointing, they're saying beyond the Eucharist. I am the bread that came down. I will, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Crucifixion. The crucifixion, yes. Vividly etched in our minds would have been that moment when Jesus was lifted up on the cross. So this is my flesh given for the life of the world. This is my body, given for the life of the world. The connection between the Last Supper, the Eucharist, and the giving of Jesus on Calvary are intimately bonded. In fact, the Eucharist is Jesus given on the cross and risen from the dead. So this is what John's theology is trying to Let's continue, verse 32. Or 52, excuse me. Mm-hmm. At this the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can he give us his flesh to eat? Thereupon Jesus said to them, Let me solemnly assure you, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has life eternal, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood real drink. The man who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the Father who has life sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so the man who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and died nonetheless, the man who feeds on this bread shall live forever. Okay. Um, I remember point right here. John chapter 6 of Jesus saying, You know, my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. And you're 
right, it would have been scandalous to the Jewish community because eating flesh is cannibal, eating human flesh and blood is cannibalism. And some of them were scandalized by this. So what do the Protestants think when they read that? How do they not see it? So the, outside the Catholic Church there are other perspectives in the Eucharist. The Eastern churches, like the Orthodox, believe in the real presence of Jesus, as do we. The Anglicans believe the Eucharist really is the body and blood of Christ. Now we have to have a disclaimer on that as Catholics because we're not sure if they kept a valid line of order for being priests along the way. Um, the Lutherans try to explain it, saying this really is the body and blood of Jesus, but it's with bread and wine. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the theology of the Eucharist. But it's something they call consubstantiation, consubstantiation or transubstantiation. So, and some believe it was simply, these are signs of Jesus. <clears throat> so they're bread and wine that are signs of Jesus. But when you look at the Greek of the Last Supper, which we're going to look more carefully at the Last Supper next week, Jesus doesn't say, this symbolizes my body. He could have said, this is a sign of my body. This is my body. This is my blood. So an identification that uh, is shockingly and, and it's, it's shocking here because they take it literally. What do you mean? We can't eat that. That's why cannibals. What's wrong with you? I just I can't imagine how Protestants can still see that and yet not see that the way we do. Yeah, it, you know, to me, it, it has been a bit of a puzzle, and we'll have to get in, into a, the deeper theology of the Eucharist and what it means, the signification of it, because the elements of bread and wine, they don't experience a physical transformation, of these Catholics say, but metaphysical. So all the elements and properties of ordinary bread and wine are still there physically and biologically and chemically. So that's the, probably the dilemma. And St. Thomas Aquinas, great theological thinker, knew it was a dilemma. He said, don't believe what your senses tell you. You know, faith is deeper than the senses. So the senses tell us it's bread and wine, but this is a mystery beyond the human senses. Did I understand you to say that Anglican Church and the Lutherans believe it is the body and blood of Christ? Traditionally, the Anglican Church Again, the Anglican Church is a broad church, so they have high and low Anglicans. They have Episcopal. Right, Episcopals are kind of the American version of the Anglican Church. But do they their priests and are able to change? So we as Catholics, uh, back in the 1800s, one of the popes said that there, we couldn't prove the evidence that they had kept their apostolic succession. So we're not certain that they're validly ordained priests. So that's a whole separate question. Well, what Catholics believe about Anglicans versus what Anglicans believe themselves. <laughs> is happening. Okay. So just I'll just throw that out there. That's an, yeah. unres an unresolved uh, point of difference at this point of perspective. So, um, but any we believe that any church, which includes all the Eastern churches, that have preserved valid apostolic succession, have a validly ordained priesthood. And all that we believe is truly the body and blood of Christ. So, um, now, in the very next verse, verse 60, then many of his disciples who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that the, his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if, this, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to, this, to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, and some of them decide they're going to leave. So verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. So this was, for many of the followers of Jesus, a deal breaker. We're not going to follow you anymore after this. And, uh, then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We 
you've come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. So this is kind of John's version of what Simon Peter will say in Caesarea Philippi. You are the Christ, or the Son of a living God. So this profound moment, we're not going to leave. I am not leaving you. I trust you. I believe your words. So this whole chapter in John's Gospel is really, I think, Eucharistic theology. It is expressing the profound, deep meaning of what the Eucharist really is. This is, I, Jesus, is saying, I am the bread of life. You eat my flesh, you drink my blood, you, you will live forever. And the flesh that I give, is my, my, this bread I give you, is my flesh, given for the life of the world, pointing to the mystery of the cross. So, I think it's uh, John's profound expression of Eucharistic theology. All right, questions or observations? I love how John writes and exposes the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It just gives it greater depth. Someone said, uh, John's Gospel often makes explicit what is implicit in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is a beautiful way of putting it. It's hidden in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John, in John's Gospel, it's made very explicit. I am the bread from heaven. You know, Moses gave you that bread, but that wasn't the true bread. I am the bread. Jesus is the bread of life. So, um, and the element of the and by the way, eating in Greek in this chapter is a very, the, the words used in Greek are munching. It's like chewing on it, like you chew on flesh. Unless you munch, and munch on my body, you don't know why. It's kind of a chewing process that's described. This is almost exactly the opposite of what the nuns taught us when we were getting ready to do our first um, <laughs> oh, 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 put it there and yeah. don't you dare chew it. I don't want your teeth. 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 I don't want your It's so funny because, in a, in a sense, that could only happen once we had gotten mechanized, making a Eucharistic bread where it could easily dissolve on your tongue. Because for the, most, for the most part, for centuries, of course, they would have taken flour and water and baked the bread. So it would have been like a, a pretty chewy loaf of bread. You couldn't have easily swallowed it unless you were chewing it. So, you know, it would have been much more substantial. And uh, now it's funny, I've got this little, uh, little insert from a Eucharistic bread company. You know, a pure, pure Eucharistic bread, not touched by human hands, dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, not touched by human hands. What about what are human hands? So, when they were doing the, the liturgical reforms at the Second Vatican Council, one letter just said, it's not hard convincing people that it, that it becomes the body and blood of Christ. It's hard to convince them that it's really bread to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, yeah, once in a while, Earlier in my first when I had more time and energy, I would for Holy Thursday I would actually bake the Eucharistic bread, so using just ordinary flour and water, and some mixed whole wheat. So it was different receiving, um, you know, substantial bread. So. Um, Excuse me. And then did you break the bread? And we sure did. Yeah, oh, some, of, some of it was pre-broken, so we scored it when we, before we baked it. And so it's easier to break apart. Yeah. So, uh, but it's a lot of work. So <laughs> yeah, it's also more humbly. You have to you have to be careful about all the fragments and all that. So yeah, it's, yeah. When I went to mass at one of the uh, missions out uh, in California, you know the early missions, communion was a little chunk of bread, a yes. little bread. Yes. Yes. Uh, well. Like bread. Well, St. Michael Catholic Church, which is the oldest Catholic church in the state of Tennessee, when you go out there, they've got a little museum room, and in there's this long metal handle thing with a circular metal thing. The priest baked his own Eucharistic bread. So he put that flour and water and made his dough and held that little thing over a fire to bake the bread over a fire. So they had no, back in the early 1800s, no way to order pre-processed bread and plastic sleeves. <laughs> Got flour and water, and he baked his bread from mass out there at the church. They've got 
uh, one that makes big hooves and some that make small hooves. And then they've got uh, a little bit of little cutters that would cut the, the breads out. In the early church, do we know that they really do a Eucharistic service? <laughs> Bread and wine? Yes, <laughs> they do, actually. Good question. In the early church, do we know that they do that? Yes, we do. And in fact, as we move forward in this class, we'll be talking okay. about the earliest description. And the earliest, of course, are in the New Testament, the breaking of the bread. And we'll be looking at the post, uh, at the resurrection appearance of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and the breaking of the bread, the risen Lord was recognized, and then vanished from their sight. After a liturgy of the word, along the way, by the way, scripture proclaimed on the path, then the breaking of the bread. So, yeah, so very early. When he said at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me, already the Acts of the Apostles, they're already breaking bread. It would have been something that happened almost immediately after the resurrection, probably, on the day of the Lord, someday. So we'll hear about that in the early documents of the church. I have a lot to hear it. So, who is the Apostles? I've been sitting here wondering. Lover of God, a friend of God, Theophilus. Uh, Luke addresses his gospel to Theophilus, uh, a friend of God, lover of God. Some scholars thought that was symbolic, you know, any lover or friend of God, but it may have been an actual person named Theophilus that Luke is writing the gospel for. And Luke says, I've investigated everything again, just to make sure, going back to the original eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, to re reinvestigate and I've presented you in an orderly sequence. Most excellent Theophilus. <laughs> we know about the Last Supper now, the Eucharist, and we've studied all of that, but how could that not have been a hard thing to hear about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? I, mean, I think it's going to be yes. That's profound. And next week, as we look at the Eucharist, at the Last Supper itself, we're going to dwell on that very thought. Because that night, when Jesus gathered the twelve in the upper room and took bread for the Passover, and notice John mentioned mobile multiplication was happening at the time of Passover. He's connecting it to the Eucharist. The bread already had the meaning embedded for a thousand years plus. This is the unleavened bread. We didn't have time to let it rise. We were hurrying out of Egypt. The blood of the doorpost, the wine, the ceremonial wine, reminding us of the Exodus. But Jesus does something entirely new. He takes the bread and says, this is my body. In, in some Semitic language, this is me. It's given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. They would have been shocked. What? This is not what? I mean, this, is not the way the, this is not the way it goes. This is not the way the service goes. And Oh, 
God is God. <laughs> there is no other. First commandment. I am the Lord your God. There is no other. God alone. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, which is easier to say, get up and pick up your mat and walk, or I forgive your sins? To show you, I'm going to prove it. Get up and pick up that mat and walk. And he gets up and he picks up the mat and he walks. I can forgive sins too. That's a minor thing. <laughs> and that walk and stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. What, what we say, implicit, explicit, like in, in the Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, and he says the words, from the mountaintop, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not kill. But I say to you, even if you grow angry with another, you've already committed murder. Well, who said of old, you shall not kill? God. He gave that commandment through Moses. God said, you shall not kill. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not kill. But I say to you, woo. What's hidden there in that implicitly? Who alone can add to what God has said but God? It's the divinity of Jesus implicitly revealed right there on the Sermon on the Mount. I have the power to speak on behalf of God. <coughs> Only God can do that. Yeah. So, yeah, so, right, so I'm, I'm sort of like a child of Figure God can create everything out of nothing. He can certainly transform the bread and wine to his body and blood. So there's a simple childlike faith that resides in me despite all of my years of study. Uh, I've heard it, I believe it, I accept it. It is it's I don't want to say it's easy, but on one level it for me it is a simply and that may be just the gift of faith, you know. I simply accept that Jesus spoke it. We will do more theological reflection, but that's just kind of a more personal encounter experience. So. I think it's easy to believe 2,000 years after it happened. If I were Jesus standing in front of you saying, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever, you would look, you would look at me like I was crazy. I'd say he's a heretic. What's done in? It makes so much oh, sense. Oh, yeah. I have no doubt that if I had lived in the days of Jesus, I would have been probably more like the Pharisees. <laughs> I would have had Jesus under the microscope saying, Are you sure you know what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would be very suspicious. You know, this person who's saying new things that I've never heard written down. This cannot be right. You know, who is this fellow? You know, um, you know, we take for granted the gift of faith in a sense, don't we? And um, I think it's in some ways we've been given the gift of the Spirit, so we're able to see through the eyes of faith and 2,000 years of tradition those who encounter Jesus in the flesh and the person. I think it was a harder call. Read, read the four Gospels, uh, even the closest to Jesus, or scratching your heads most of the way. Peter, God forbid that any such thing should ever happen to you, he told Jesus, with the first prediction of the cross. Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. You remember Jesus' reply, right? Get behind me, he said. Trying to tell me off this path. Get behind me, follow me up to Jerusalem. Okay, that's a good reflection tonight. Um, we do have a few minutes left before 8.30. If anybody wanted to break into small reflection question groups, I do have some reflection questions, but it's also anybody who wants to journey homeward can um, at this point. Um, and next Tuesday we gather again, uh, 7 o'clock, and we are going to move right into the Last Supper next week and the death and resurrection of Jesus.
ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ